Let's have another round of applause for Marcus. In case you didn't know, the best time to write is... Yeah. The best place to write is... Here. The best people to write are... Yes. All of us! <laughs> Anita, you are on deck. Our next performer is a former champion of the Writing Nights Grand Tournament. He has learned to channel the emotions associated with his experiences into his writing, much like many of us. Started out in Columbus, now is in Cleveland-ish. Please welcome Mr. Cortez Harris. Someone's in pain, you need to fix it. My mom's first story yeah. of my grandmother's death sound like leaves plummeting to the graves in the fall. She said her demise had everything to do with age. Last time gravity would pull her towards me, she was waving a grave goodbye. When death finally opened its mouth, I watched my 300-pound uncle carry his body up a large hill. His eyes brimming with my mother's blood. At her funeral, my quivering hand tried to max my eyes as I watched my mom through the spaces between my fingers fold her body around the coffin. That was the first time I heard my mother scream. I knew then that her funeral had nothing to do with the wrinkles on her skin. After the burial, I began to have a recollection of my mom weeping as she pulled my siblings and I from my grandmother's voices or the pink pill box where she would count each pill before swallowing as if her silence begged for them. When her mouth moved, her words would crawl into the ears of an ethereal body when my bones grew. My mom shared a second story. She says she pretended that the voices in my grandmother's head never exist one time. She watched us alone, but the pills were not enough to keep the voices quiet. One afternoon, my mom received a phone call. It was my grandmother pleading that she picks us up quickly before she never saw our smiles again inside. My grandmother's head was radio static, where she could hear voice cut in and out, cut in and out some incurable sound effect. The last time anyone saw her, she was perched on a bridge, her wings stretched wide as an albatross. A nearby bison begged her to come down, but the mouse inside her body told her to come home. Twenty years later, I never stopped driving by my grandmother's house just to see if it will speak to me. Meanwhile, my mom still believes that the same voices that haunted my grandmother, will resurrect from the ground, find her head, create a new voice. During her family dinner, she watched her father's shadow snake from the his jawbone barely moved as they ate. The blood in his eyes tore through them like the knife thing. They all bled internally. He pulled the last of his body from the chair. He blared out, I cannot breathe any longer in this marriage. Her mom bowed to the ground, pleaded for a black hole to grab a hold of her. He fled from the kitchen without finishing the rest of his meal. That was five years ago. 
His plate still lingers at the kitchen table. It is as dead as he left it. Everything had molded just like her father. Maybe this is why she fed my bones to the ground after I fallen in love with her. I was a tree in a field of dead grass. She was a deceased leaf refusing to let go. My father warned me to run from her fingernails. Every day I am without her. I find more of my remains. I have placed her face onto every woman I could not love. I try to light every memory of her on fire. I ran out of magic. There were tongues in my head, found the way there after a passion declared from the pulpit, we are living in the last day. He was saying it religiously, and this earth was an enormous coal fire. I spent most of my childhood glaring at the sky, waiting for God to rip his fingers through it, clouds turning into horns. He will speak of earth as if gasoline was spreading around us. Being human was a wicked angel. Waking up was a terrible sin, as if there was nothing pure about being alive. I survived the nightmares of my mother giving birth to me in a river of lava, her arms burning at the bone as she tried to push me back into her womb. Every Sunday morning, witnessing a path to try to pull apart his flesh, he wanted nothing to do with his human body. My mother whispering to me how she felt my father bare in the closet, fingers pressed at his skin, moaning, I don't want to go to hell, and I, a young boy, afraid of God, afraid of Sunday morning, afraid of not breathing, afraid of falling asleep, falling to my knees, afraid of not praying. God was coming. Instead of building a treehouse, we built a church inside the rustic storage shed in our backyard. We talked about how the time we had left to live and how we were still kids who wanted to make the most of playing with fire. Our whole childhood was spent digging holes into the ground, trying to see for ourselves if Satan really exists. We feared waking up like our parents, too afraid to watch the sun rise from the dead, and they say God is coming. Isn't he already here? While I was pregnant, I tied a snake around my arm. My caseworker tirelessly tried to get me to hand over the venom. Both of my arms are full of snake holes. It's a damn shame I am not dead yet. Every night I have nightmares of my children rehearsing my funeral. My youngest son pretending his bed is my coffin. My daughter reading from a blank sheet of paper as if it were an eulogy. When they are finished, both of their faces are wet rags. There is no love here. This school, a crocodile's mouth full of quivering children. I don't know how you find a prayer to pass through its teeth in the morning. What type of God do you cry out to? Those young boys with their arms lifted to the sky like light posts are trying to catch the bullet shells falling from their dead homies ascending to heaven. The only longing is to live long enough to feel their pulse before they reach high school. We stop praying for them. Instead, we count their breaths, reminding us that they are still alive.
I had a nightmare the other day that my mom asked me to choose being held between her arms or my dad. I chose her, but I really wanted to lay down in all of the grass on my dad's arm for homework. I get to watch my parents fight each other. When my teacher screams, I see my parents' teeth. What makes me angry is that my teacher doesn't care that my refrigerator door at home is being held together by cobwebs. All there is to eat is an empty food cabinet I lick for dinner. My own saliva of the only meal feeding my stomach. Only when my hands are folded, mouth full of thick silence, is when I am praying. They want me suspended. They don't want my black body. The stairway at school, the stairway at home are very much the same. On New Year's Eve, I watch my uncle fall asleep in a puddle of his own blood. We were just playing the Xbox together, but a bullet paused the game. He still held the controller. I wish my parents would have walked me home. A mother uncovers fossils of her son after officers buried his body beneath a field of gunpowder. Hmm. He asks his teacher, do you hate me? His teacher abruptly stops fumbling through a pile of papers without names. Of course I don't, he uttered unnervingly. He asks his teacher a final question. Is it true that the planet moves and never sits still on its axis? His teacher eyes cease a like a raccoon marbled by headlights. The teacher went on to ask him to take a seat. Only this time he was active. I have three handsome sons, not a single daughter, some kind of curse. For homework, I have three handsome sons, not a single daughter, some kind of curse. On Sundays, we eat popcorn together. The TV is never on, but we stare at it. My younger son asked me the other night. How come Granddad never joined us? I threw the popcorn and yelled, there is no talking, not while the TV is off. He glared at me as if I was the most appalling film he has ever choked on. You know nothing of forfeits until you become one. <laughs> I still recall in college, when I was named a walking stick. <laughs> it was all funny until I noticed all of the tree branches. Soon after, I started dating women with small valleys I still remember. When my father said to me, you are not muscle enough. I said, I am all men. He said, not your body. I can barely recognize the body of my childhood neighborhood, but the road still remembers the flesh of my father's tires it used to carry. I can still see the shadows of my unlaced sneakers darting across the streets like the squirrels we could never catch, the abandoned garages we broke into with our small hands, where anything we touched instantly turned into gold. I still remember my neighborhood buddies and I jumping off rooftops with umbrellas, believing if we just held on to our imaginations long enough, we will float a little longer, proving to our strict parents that we can do anything if they allowed us to take risks. I still remember us 
chasing after dogs, trying to pretend how fast we could run from strangers, or the apples I would pick from my neighbor's yard. One time, I about bit one, and it tastes like a ball of sugar, all the sweets I needed to run from my father when he would ungird his belt from his waist. I still return to that same kid those days when I drive down my face neighborhood. See, you can gut out our rooms, but you can never kill our memories, for they will always lead us back home. Thank you, everyone. 